Okay, so for our last panel, it is the spy who didn't come in from the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Surveillance in the name of national security versus privacy. And for this, we'll look at the Cold War, McCarthyism, the Pentagon Papers, WikiLeaks, and of course, the Snowden Affair um, and NSA. And on this panel, we have a terrific group, as we have all day. Um, first up, we have David Cole, who is a professor of law and public policy at Georgetown University. It was my con law professor in law school. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nadine Strassen, who's also a professor of law at New York Law School and a former president of the ACLU. Bart Gelman, the great class of 82, who um, <laughs> is probably best known as, for his journalistic work and for breaking the Snowden Affair uh, story for the Washington Post, but he also teaches here, so I put a plug in for him there. We think of him as Woodrow Wilson School first. Um, and Karen Greenberg, who's the director of the Center on National Security at Fordham University School of Law. And moderating is Peter Baker, who you probably see every single day on the front page of the New York Times byline, um, who's the White House correspondent for the Times. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all for hanging around for the last, but hopefully the best of all the panels you've seen today. I, 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 we're going to tax your patience just a little while longer, but I promise you I think it'll be a fun uh, conversation. We've got four fabulous, column, uh, four fabulous uh, panelists up here who will uh, uh, enlighten us all. Uh, I want to start off by noting that the, the, the New York Times, my paper, and CBS News this week took a poll. You probably you might have read it, some of the results of it about ISIS and foreign policy and so forth. But there was a question in there that uh, didn't get a lot of attention I thought was appropriate today. It asked Americans whether they think the United States has gone too far, not far enough, or struck the right balance in restricting civil liberties in the interest of fighting terrorism, right? Which seems like a pretty good question to ask these days. And I'm going to tell you the answer, but before I do that, I just want, for the sake of curiosity, I want to try it here with this crowd, no. okay? Let's, let's, I'm just curious, let's just try this out. Raise your hand if you think the United States has gone too far in restricting civil liberties in the interest of te fighting terrorism. Uh. <laughs> all right, good, all right. Now tell me, how many here think it hasn't gone far enough? Oh. Okay, okay. a couple, okay. good, all right, that's fine. And, and how many think it's gotten the balance about right? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Well, that's great. You know, your, your fellow Americans, the results are a little bit different, <laughs> uh, but interesting nonetheless, and I think informative and important. Uh, according to this poll, just under half, or 48% of Americans right now think that we get the balance just about right. About 28% think we've gone too far, and about 18% say not far enough. Now, that balance number, the one in the middle, we've gotten it just about right, that number stayed pretty stable. That hasn't really changed in the last couple of years. But the other two numbers actually uh, have changed significantly in the last year or so since we last asked the question. Uh, the people who think we've gone too far, that number uh, is eight points higher today than it was about a year or so ago. And the folks who think we haven't gone far enough, that's eight points lower than it was about a year or so ago. So in other words, a 16 point swing in the last year and a half. Now, who are those 16% of Americans reading? Hmm. I think we could say that for one thing, they're reading Bart Gelman here. And one reason they're thinking about these issues and coming to conclusions is because uh, they've had the benefit of his, uh, uh, his great journalism. He's, of course, one of the reporters who broke the story after story on the NSA programs, won a Pulitzer Prize for that. Uh, one of three, I think, you've had a part in, right? Is that right? Plus the Polk Award and the Overseas Press Award. And it really is quite disgusting for his competitors, <laughs> but it's all very well deserved. And, of course, the most important credential is his... Uh, is his degree from some, some <laughs> mid-Atlantic university that, uh, of some renown. One of the great privileges of my career was working with Bart at the Washington Post and watching him do what he does day after day. It was really uh, uh, quite uh, impressive. He, a uh, uh, little known story you probably may not be aware of, on 9-11 he, he hitched a ride on the back of a Harley Davidson headed toward lower Manhattan while everybody else was heading the other direction. And he covered the consequences of that day in our society ever since. Um, so he's obviously also wrote a terrific book on Dick Cheney, which I stole from liberally for a book of my own, and he's now working on a book about surveillance and the Snowden affair. Bart, tell us a little bit about the process you in, uh, uh, engaged in when you had to decide which of these documents and which of these programs to disclose, because in fact, you didn't just simply throw them all on the web. You did make decisions. And were there some you decided, you and your editor decided, no, we're not going to disclose. That's not reasonable to, to, uh, to reveal to the public. Right. So. First, there are a lot of them. 
uh, and obviously neither I nor anyone else in possession of these documents has decided to put them all up on the web. Uh, Snowden would not have needed journalists if he wanted to do that. He knew how to use the internet. Uh, I've burned a lot more uh, time from lawyers and technologists uh, than I used to. Uh, I took very seriously the idea, and I, I knew right away, I knew as I was reading the first document uh, that I was never going to be party to publishing uh, all of them or even all of that one. Uh, and I knew that that meant that I needed to take uh, much more substantial steps than I'd ever taken before to protect the security of the material that I had. Um, I was actually on, regarded as being on the paranoid side in our newsrooms uh, for years now. I mean, I've used encryption tools for a long time. It's been a very long time since my notes were stored in the clear on anything. But uh, this material needed much more significant uh, protection. Uh, our broadest standard, as we thought about it, now I'm speaking uh, about the way we talked about it at the Washington Post, uh, was that we wanted to surface big policy decisions uh, that were being made on our behalf that the public didn't know about. Uh, if, they, if they were, we, we were looking at where the U.S. government draws the boundaries of secret intelligence in a democratic society. Um, how it decides how much it can spy on its own citizens on whose behalf it is supposed to be working. And so we weren't trying to uh, publish stories. In fact, we were trying very hard not to publish stories that would decide a question. So if you reveal certain kinds of things, that's the end of it. It's over. Uh, we weren't trying to end programs. We were trying to write stories that would enable debate about where the line should be drawn in those programs. Were there some where you said, well, this is kind of a reasonable program, they're within the law as far as we understand it, we're just gonna kinda keep quiet about it? Sure, or there, look, look, the easiest calls, um, the easiest calls are where there's something that seems to be directly contrary to the public understanding of where the boundaries are. Uh, and it, it would be, has been controversial in other contexts. Um, on the other hand, another easy call uh, I, d I don't actually want to give a real example, uh, <laughs> so I'll, 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 uh, I'll make one up. Um, NSA has uh, devised fabulous new mind-reading technology that it's implanted in the mistress of the uh, Emperor of Mars and discovered uh, invasion plans. Uh, that's not a story I want to write. Uh, I think most people would say, good. Uh, I mean, th there's a category of stories where they'd say, wow, that's cool, I didn't know the NSA could do that. Uh, I'm glad they're doing that, and too bad you wrote it because now they can't do it anymore. That's the story I don't want to write. Right. All right, I'm going to bring in Nadine Strassen here. She was, uh, uh, you already heard, she was president of the ACLU. She wasn't just the president of the ACLU, she was the first woman and the youngest person ever to serve as president of the ACLU. She served for 17 years, is that right? 18. 18 years. During her time there, she nearly doubled its membership. She led the organization in the thick of all sorts of really interesting fights, uh, uh, landmark Supreme Court case on censorship and school prayer and uh, abortion rights, religious freedom, prisoner rights. I read this uh, today that you were the daughter of a Holocaust survivor who, uh, who was rescued by American troops just a day before he was scheduled to be executed. And Right, and also to tie it, I'm sorry, I, yeah. mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, and what's striking is that you took from that experience a belief, a firm belief in civil liberties to the point where you support it, liberty for everybody, including the neo-Nazis who marched in Skokie, which is, I think, uh, remarkable. And she, uh, I also read that you get up at 8, 4.30 every morning without an alarm. That's when I went to ACLU president. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, time you, what time do you get up this morning? So, oh, 5.30. Okay, oh, she slept in. So Nadine's, we're gonna bring Nadine, I think she has a question for Bart I had a follow-up question for Bart, and it relates partly to what um, Jeff Stone said today, and also to a panel that Jeff and I were on in Chicago this summer, uh, the Seventh Circuit Judicial Conference, and I was defending Ed Snowden as a hero for the reasons that Anthony Romero made clear in his question. And um, one of the points that I made was that, as I understood it, Snowden did not personally disclose anything directly to the public. He used you and other um, members of the press as intermediaries and as screeners. And when I made that point, I was booed <laughs> and hissed 
by the federal judges. I asked Je uh, Jeff uh, how he interpreted that. I guess, you know, I, I, I guess to some extent journalists are also not necessarily so respected by that group. But um, I was, is, am I factually incorrect? And then a, a, a second point to that question is uh, Jeff's uh, contention that most of what Snowden revealed, i.e. what the press revealed, uh, is doing harm. And it's only the portion that relates to the metadata program that has done more harm than good. Well, we'll go that line, yeah. Uh, right, yeah, I actually sorry. had a, I had a version of this panel at the Second Circuit oh. Judicial Conference oh. <laughs> uh, in New York, uh, where just about every uh, trial and appellate judge and U.S. attorney in four states was there. And I must say, I actually got I, I got what they found to be an unexpectedly respectful hearing. <laughs> they were they were uh, they were expecting to boo. Uh, and I think the more I talk about the process the more they recognize it as being serious, at least even if they don't agree with the results. It's easy to start from the proposition that who the hell elected you? Uh, you're not responsible to the public for decisions you made. You're not the classification authority. Uh, and, and the answer is that there are fundamental tensions in, uh, in, in a democracy and the idea of accountable self-government in which we don't value security above all things. It's one of the six purposes of we the people in the Constitution. Uh, and here I am talking to the ACLU about this. Uh, I, but holding the government accountable for its use of power, for its decisions on our behalf is also fairly fundamental. That is properly my job. Uh, I don't claim the power uh, to make classification decisions in general, generically. There are actually, there by, uh, by uh, one scholarly account, more classified documents on planet Earth than there is unclassified knowledge, published knowledge. Uh, that was a 10-year-old study at Harvard. Uh, so I am obviously no one person, certainly not me, is in charge of deciding that boundary. But when I find out things that are pertinent to big public debates, um, it is my job to decide uh, what ought to be published. I, there is always very extensive com uh, consultation with the government, so they they know um, I've given them a 48-hour guarantee, and it tends to be more than that uh, ahead of time. Every single fact that I intend to disclose, they have an opportunity to be heard and to persuade me that stuff should not be put in. Often, I say, "Well, I'm not willing to get rid of this whole subject matter, but if the, you know, but if there's a particular detail that's bothering you, and so you know, there was a case in which I w there were four people I thought I could name." Uh, in one of these stories because I knew that they were already all in custody or dead. Uh, and they persuaded me that in two of the cases, uh, naming them would blow other uh, ongoing operations for people in their networks. I believed them. I kept those two names out. They stopped fighting about the other two names. I put those names in. I don't always accept their, uh, their request. Uh, most Prominently, they asked me not to name the companies that were giving data to the government in the PRISM program, the very first story I wrote. And here's an example of how we think about it. They sa I said, why wouldn't you want me to name Google and Microsoft and Apple and so on? And they said, uh, because uh, if you name them, they might not stop, they might stop cooperating. And I said, if the harm that you're worried about consists of uh, that the public won't like what you're doing and might ask you to stop doing it either through market forces or through the vote, and that's why we publish it. Uh, that's, that's, that's the debate we want to enable. Let me, um, let me bring in David Cole here. Uh, David, of course, is at Georgetown. He makes, he's so prolific at writing, he makes the rest of us look lazy, I have to say. In addition to teaching, he writes, it seems like, every other issue of the New York Review of Books. He's in The Nation. He's in all these other publications. He's got... Uh, seven books which have received honors like the American Book Award and the Palmer Civil Liberties Prize. Uh, he wrote the other day in the New York Review book that President Obama uh, is wrong to think he can bomb in, in Syria without uh, approval from Congress. And when he shows up in court, you know something interesting is about to happen uh, because he uh, was involved, with, among others, the famous flag burning case at the Supreme Court. And Matt Hentoff called him a one-man committee of correspondence in the tradition of patriot <laughs> Sam Adams, which I love that. <laughs> Since you go back to Sam Adams, help us uh, <laughs> put this in context. Put this in the, in the context of this period we're supposed to talk about here from the Cold War today. How, how does Bart Gelman, how does Edward Snowden, how does Bradley Manning, how do they fit into this context? 
Well, that's a, that's a, 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 broad, a very broad question, and, and I, I guess I want to say a couple things. One is I, is I think that there's been um, uh, an, an, an evolution uh, over that time, from the McCarthy era to the current period, um, both in uh, civil society, uh, and that's reflected, I think, in the ACLU, um, and uh, to a degree in the, in, in the courts as well. And so, um, uh, so, for example, during the McCarthy era, uh, the um, ACLU was, uh, was hounding its own communists uh, out of the, off of the ACLU board, and, and there was very, um, there, was a, there was a minimal uh, civil society sort of defense of people who were identified as, uh, the, as the enemy. Um, uh, and it was very, you, you would be painted as the enemy if you, de if you, uh, if you defended the enemy. The courts uh, didn't uh, really step in to restrict what was being done in the McCarthy era until um, it was politically sort of safe to do so, namely after McCarthy had gone too far in going after the army and, ha and had ultimately been censored by the Senate. And then the Supreme Court came in and, and, and ruled in various cases uh, that you have a right to associate, uh, uh, that you have a right to speak, uh, and even to advocate criminal activity um, uh, up to up to a very, uh, very, uh, a very far point before the government can actually um, prosecute you. So, uh, you know, you compare that uh, to the um, to the modern period, uh, where the ACLU has been tremendously uh, active in protecting uh, all kinds of people defending Edward Snowden, who is seen as a villain by at least half of the American people, uh, filing suit on behalf of Anwar al-Awlaki, who uh, uh, was, was a, a alleged to be a, uh, the, 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 the mastermind of two foiled terrorist plots on the, uh, on the American people, uh, really out front uh, in defending uh, civil liberties. And the ACLU is not alone, right? There are a whole host of civil society organizations today that did, literally did not exist in the McCarthy era. The Center for Constitutional Rights, with which I got my uh, start, Human Rights Watch, uh, which Arya played a, a critical role in Human Rights First, Amnesty International, the Center for Democracy and Technology, Electronic Freedom Fund, uh, there's, all, there's just a, there's a, a there really um, uh, vibrant civil society. And I think that vibrant civil society has played an important role in, uh, in checking uh, some of the worst of what we have done and probably played a more important role uh, than the courts have. So yes, the courts have developed some more protective doctrines over time and I think the, court, the Supreme Court in the first four cases that it heard in the war on terror, to many people's surprise and certainly to historians' surprise, voted, ruled against the uh, Bush administration but in relatively narrow ways. Um, uh, it didn't require the end, no court required the end of torture, no court required the closing of CIA black sites, no court uh, required uh, that, that um, we stop rendering people to other countries to be tortured, no court uh, uh, has, no final order has, has resulted in the release of a person from Guantanamo. Um, uh, and yet, uh, the, the black sites are closed, the torture uh, w was stopped before President Bush uh, left office, the black sites were closed before President Bush left office, over 500 people had been freed from Guantanamo before President Bush left office. Um, so, uh, and, and not, that was not by virtue of, of judicial uh, uh, orders, that was, I think, by virtue of the resistance uh, that civil society fomented. Uh, and, and, and thereby affecting elite opinion and to a, to a degree um, a, a, a public opinion. And, and, and you know, Snowden is, 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 is another example of this. He lets this information out and Bart writes about it and Glenn Greenwald writes about it, but it's really what civil society does with it in terms of pushing for reforms, in terms of uh, seeking uh, uh, responsive action from the, from the, from the executive, from Congress, and from the courts uh, that, that we're uh, moving to. Let me, uh, I want to bring in Karen here, because Karen, uh, she's director of the Center for National Security, you heard at Fordham Law School, and one of the real authorities on issues of war 
in human rights. She's edited a number of important books, including one called The uh, Torture Papers, right, which I think told, uh, provide a real roadmap for uh, people to understand what happened with Abu Ghraib. Machiko Kakatani in our paper called it necessary if grueling reading for anyone interested in understanding the backstories to those terrible photos that really shocked the world. And she made a real splash with another book a few years back called The, uh, the Least Worst Place about Guantanamo Bay and uh, named one of the best books of 2009 by the Washington Post and Slate and my Bart's and my former colleague, or still current colleague for Bart, Peter Finn, called it in the Washington Post a surprising and fascinating account of how military officers in Guantanamo struggled in the absence of any clear direction from Washington to create internationally acceptable conditions. Do you think the courts, let's talk about the courts because we were talking about this the other day. Do you think the courts have played the role they ought to play? Should they, have they been <coughs> too deferential in effect, uh, as David is in effect saying, that as opposed to civil society, or should they be deferential to the executive branch? What role should courts be playing at this point? Should it be a democratic process? The role they should society? play or domestic? Mm -hmm. The role they should play is yeah. they should say all of this has just gone too far and we need to pull it back. They're not gonna do that. So I, I just want to start a little bit before that, but I'll get to that. First thing, I, I want to weigh in on this ACLU thing. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, you know, as a person who's just standing outside no of this. No squelching speech here. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Okay, good. Um, you know, getting to watch from the outside, um, like the ACLU, I'm the historian of the ACLU now. Like I'm one of the people. There are a lot of, maybe all of us. Mm -hmm. But um, as a person who's had to participate in this world, both in terms of getting to know what the government thinks about its security agenda and what those who are opposed to many of the developments have done. I, I want to just say it is, it is mind boggling how important the ACLU has been. And if we, you know, when there, there's a lot of players, and I know there are a lot of NGOs that have worked on this, David, but, and I, listen, I don't belong to the ACLU, so, you know, not related. I'm telling you. We can you, fix that. I'm, <laughs> no, okay. no I, I like my independence. I am telling you what the ACLU has done um, under Anthony during this period will go down in history as the only thing that kept this government from running all over us. Now, that's just what I think, but let me tell you why I think that. The ACLU did two things very early on that I don't know why they did it, actually. The first was to decide and that in addition to going to courts and using court cases and advocacy and you know, being the watchdog and oh my God, the world's gonna fall apart because of the Patriot Act. In addition to that, they decided that transparency was an important issue. And so the, the, you know, when, when people think about the ACLU now, they think oh, FOIA request. But you know what? It wasn't always that way. And this decision to use FOIA as a way to get information. Sometimes the Post got it, sometimes the Times got it, sometimes the ACLU got it. Changed the course of what we were able to know what to say to Congress, to other people. And if you look over time at what happened with these policies, the issue of revelation and transparency um, has taken a course that has pushed back some, it's the only thing that's pushed back. And I'm not saying it's pushed back totally successfully, but it, it's, it's where you go. If you know you have an issue, if the FBI shows up at your door, if you have an organization you think is being surveilled, whatever it is, it's the place to go. And the, and the best way I can tell it to you is, when I go places and I, people say to me, oh, you're one of those ACLU you people. I'm like, it's not an ACLU, but it's, it's the name they give. And so a panelist on the last panel said that, you know, if you're gonna write constitutional history, you used to write it through the Supreme Court, and now you look at you know, ACLU as, a, as another way of doing it. This will be such an important peer, uh, organization to look at, and I would like the archives, by the way, <laughs> Anthony. I want those archives that I've been begging you for, you know, that are in your office still. Um, um, so I think that's a, a very, the second thing is, and I don't understand, the, again, why this decision was made, although I think it goes to court challenges and seeing what could be challenged in the court, is that if you look at whatever, okay, so what did the ACLU do first? They, they um, and David's written about that, this, they, um, they protested in a variety of ways against the roundups of Muslims, Muslim citizens and others in the United States, et cetera. But soon thereafter, maybe starting in the uh, middle 2002 before that, they decided that surveillance was the issue. Now let me tell you what the rest of us were doing. We were worried, yes, we knew that the Patriot Act was a, a, something to be worried about, and particularly 215, 218, there were a number of clauses. But 
But a lot of people were focusing on Guantanamo, were focusing on detention, were focusing on the issue of, at that point, although this fell by the wayside, criminal trials and who was being put in you know, what kind of status, enemy combatant status. And the ACLU decided early on that they were going to make surveillance their issue. And when the FISA court, the FISA court in 2002 has two meetings. One is the FISA court, one is the FISA court of review. They are secret. Nobody's supposed to know what, what goes on. But for a variety of reasons, the ACLU and others in Congress, uh, Senator Leahy, find out what is going on. And the ACLU files a brief, right. an amicus brief, in the court of review, uh, uh, FISA court of review. <laughs> From that moment on, the ACLU had surveillance as in their pocket as what they were going to do. And if you look at the history of surveillance, I, I love that you brought up torture, David. I, I, wa I want to do this comparison between what happened with torture and what happened with surveillance. And my way of saying it, you said the courts didn't you know, stop rendition, the courts didn't rule on torture. The no, because it never got to the courts. It never got to the courts for a variety of reasons. Some of them might have been protests. Some might have been the way it was revealed. Some might have been how much of the American public was opposed to torture, including people in Congress. We could, we could talk about that. But, but surveillance from the very beginning was a court issue. And it was a, a very odd court issue because, and I, I don't know as much about it as I'd like to because no one does, but remember, if I were going to write this chapter, I would call it how a crime becomes a law. Because at the same time that the ACLU is pushing and pushing against what is being surveilled, who is being surveilled, you'd need to tell us. The, the, the courts are ruling on this in such a way that Congress is able to amend, is, and Congress and the courts are able to amend FISA so that it gets more and more flexible and that it has more and more authority in a broader way against, for surveillance. So you actually end up with a FISA court that's established to have, to make sure we don't have warrantless surveillance in that period right after the terrorist uh, surveillance program ends, approving warrantless surveillance. Now that, ha right? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is the courts have, I don't see them as fixing things. I see them as making us all not fight. <laughs> Karen, on, 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 on the ACLU strategy, I was uh, still in leadership at that time when uh, we were meeting, we couldn't physically meet because the office was shut down, all of downtown New York was essentially like a militarized zone, but we would have conference calls, and I remember a theme that was struck from the beginning, and unfortunately continues to be dominant, is two sides of the coin, and you referred to both of them in your remarks. Uh, number one, that we the people are not getting enough information about what the government is doing in our name. Uh, oppressive secrecy. And number two, and they're mutually reinforcing, the government is getting far too much information about we the people. Yeah. And it's created such a vicious cycle, which very much came to, uh, to play in, in Jeff's excellent remarks. I mean, uh, the surveillance programs, we still don't only know the tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, Jeff said that uh, the NSA has stopped uh, in, in, in engaging in collection of, of, of emails and online communications, uh, but there's a lot of surmise that they are, in, although they're not doing that under their statutory authority, 215, that maybe they're doing it under the executive order. Just one example that we don't know uh, the degree of surveillance that's going on. The ACLU and Human Rights Watch did a fantastic report this summer about the pernicious, and this ties back to this panel very directly, the pernicious impact of surveillance on journalism, on human rights activists, and on lawyers as, as three professions that are particularly adversely affected. So the lack of information perpetuates the spying, which, you know, a downward vicious spiral. And, and that's why I give, sorry to come back to this theme, why I give so much credit to whistleblowers, because that seems to be the only way of breaking the cycle of secrecy. Well, let me ask, let me ask David about that, because David, you wrote in the New York Review of Books uh, a few months back uh, about Snowden, Manning, Assange, and uh, you wrote, if I can find it here, uh, that while irresponsible disclosures unquestionably undermine national security, responsible leaks are an important check on secrecy's abuse. 
And you seem to make a distinction between Snowden and Manning Assange, on the other hand. I wonder if you could talk about that distinction. How do we decide what's a responsible leak and what's not a responsible leak? Isn't that, in fact, the argument that the government makes, which is that, in fact, it's not for Bart Gelman or Glenn Greenwald or Edward Snowden to decide what's responsible or what's not. It should be for a duly constituted government or court. Right. No, I, I think this is one of the hardest issues, and I, I think I agree with both Jeff uh, and Anthony, uh, <laughs> and, uh, because they're both right uh, in, 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 in the sense that um, Snowden, uh, you know, engaged in an incredible act of courage. Here he was, you know, earning a very nice living, living in Hawaii, uh, you know, had a beautiful girlfriend, and uh, gave all that up to um, live, for presumably, for the rest of his life uh, in hiding in a country like Russia. And, you know, I, it's just, you know, that's not something you do lightly. And, um, and I do think he has touched off, you know, on the benefit side, touched off the most significant debate about technology and privacy that we have, that the world has ever engaged in. And I emphasize the world, not just America. Uh, this debate is going on all over the world. And here I disagree with Jeff. I don't think, you know, I think it's the 215 program benefits uh, outweigh the, the, the harms. But I think on the foreign intelligence side, benefits are tremendous there too. I, I don't think that some, just because someone doesn't hold an American passport uh, that their privacy should just be, you know, thrown to the NSA. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's, it's not an issue when we're collecting uh, the content of email and telephone calls from thousands and thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of people. It's not an issue simply because they're foreign nationals outside of the United States. So I think there are benefits to what he has disclosed. Just uh, when you say thousands, just substitute hundreds of millions, which, well, would, yeah. 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 which would be more um, accurate. Uh, so, so, no, so. Uh, so there are there are, there are clearly benefits. There are clearly uh, costs, and I think you know the, the uh, assessing the. Um, the, the rightness or wrongness of any particular disclosure requires looking at the benefits, looking at the costs, and then looking in particular at whether the disclosure was done in a responsible way that sought to tailor uh, the disclosure so that it didn't irresponsibly disclose stuff that has a lot of cost without much benefit. Um, and here, you know, I think if you look at Manning and Assange together, they ultimately dumped on the, on the world millions of documents um, which had no, which, which showed no um, wrongdoing, which raised no um, serious policy, constitutional, fundamental uh, rights uh, kinds of questions, which posed serious risk to in identified individuals who had come, who had risked their own uh, safety to come forward to U.S. Embi embassy officials in repressive regimes, uh, where if there if it becomes known that they have talked to an embassy official, they will be or could well be the subject of repression. They do that on the basis of a, of a promise of confidentiality that's thrown out the window by the Manning and Assange uh, 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 disclosures. You know, you know, I think a, a tremendously irresponsible way. And so I don't consider Manning or Assange to be heroes at all. And I think it's, it's, we, we should resist this kind of, anyone who's whistleblowing is a good whistleblower. No, I think you have to engage in that hard question. I think Snowden's actually a harder, because on the one hand, Snowden dis did dump everything on Bart and Glenn Greenwald and Laura Parkins, I guess. Uh, and so he's ultimately, so, so you know, and they, they don't have security clearances, and we don't know how responsible they're gonna be. Uh, I think, you know, they've shown themselves to be responsible. I think Bart's shown himself to be more responsible than Glenn Greenwald in terms of what he has disclosed. Um, but, you know, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint venture, really, between uh, Edward Snowden, Bart Galman, Glenn Greenwald, and Laura Quatros as to what's going to be disclosed or not disclosed with consultation. And, and the consultation is ob obviously very important. But from the standpoint of Snowden himself, you know, is the, is the difference between Manning and Snowden that Manning picked Assange, who is, uh, you know, not particularly uh, responsible, and, uh, and Snowden picked th these three who are more responsible. You know, that's the, uh, I don't know. Let me ask Bart about this, because this is obviously, of all the people in this room, I think he's the only one who's actually met Edward Snowden. And I, I, he went to Moscow to talk to him, 
And I, I guess one of the things I think a lot of people wonder about Snowden is maybe a lot of the stuff he put out there are things we ought to know about. Maybe the government should have been doing some of the things that he disclosed. But who is this guy who then goes to a place like Russia where, let's face it, the Espionage Act would be like a civil liberties law <laughs> and is, you know, and, and, is, and, is, and is under their shelter. I think that raises a lot of questions for some people, even those who might be sympathetic to him under circumstances about his uh, motivations and, and so on. How do, you, how do you look at him in that regard? Okay, so I'll, I'll make a few points. Uh, first, I mean, I'm not his spokesman or his lawyer or anything like that. Uh, and I'm prepared to answer questions about him, and it's certainly a legitimate question to decide, you know, did this one guy behave in a way that you consider uh, laudable or the opposite or somewhere in between? Uh, I do think it can crowd out the much bigger and to me much more important question of holding our government accountable for the decisions it made with its you know, sort of 30, you know, sort of it, with its 30,000 employees and its $10 billion annual budget and its technologies that the world has never seen, and the degree of intrusiveness uh, that's never existed because uh, it couldn't exist before now. Uh, I think those are the bigger and more important questions. Uh, yeah. As far as Snowden, uh, facts matter a lot here. He, uh, I don't believe he did give us everything he took. Uh, I know that he said he did not trust himself to make the decisions about what should be public, that he said that uh, there were things that he thought were very problematic and needed to be subject to public debate, but he wanted that to be tested uh, by the judgment of others, by journalists, and he's, he expected that there, <coughs> that, we would, that there would be large amounts of the material that we would not publish, but without looking at it, we couldn't understand uh, the full nature of the issues that, uh, that uh, involving the things that we could publish. Uh, and let's also be clear that he didn't choose Russia. Uh, he was trying, he was, he was looking for a place to, uh, to go. Um, he had a flight that transited Russia. Uh, Russian authorities discovered while he was in flight that the U.S. had revoked his passport and was therefore did not have valid traveling papers and there was nowhere else he could go. He's, he is stuck there. It's not the place he chooses to live. Uh, all that being said, uh, it would be tough for anyone to advocate a pure model in which anybody, any of the 4.2 million people who work within the classified world, who have classified clearances, so just think about what the implications of that are. There's four million people who work in this secret system. Uh, you, couldn't say, you couldn't say it's a good model that any one of them at any time can decide, uh, let's release this. Uh, I, think this should, I think the public should know about this. Uh, that's not a workable model, uh, because there are serious reasons for secrecy, as there are serious reasons for disclosure. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about the effects of transparency here, the importance of transparency, because I'm, I'm a fact guy. We take for granted all the time that efficient and fair workings of the marketplace require a, a level playing field of information. So there's laws. You know, companies have to disclose things uh, through SEC reports. Uh, before they make a public offering. Uh, in campaigns, there are fewer disclosure requirements than there used to be, but, uh, but we've taken for granted that a democracy is to function well, uh, that, that, uh, that there need to be facts about the campaigns and who's behind the campaigns uh, that are made public. There's a general presumption that court hearings uh, should be public, that congressional hearings should be public, and so on. There are exceptions, but the idea is that the sunlight makes better decisions and lets anybody participate who's affected. Uh, and what we've had in the post 9-11 environment is the development or the acceleration and growth of this extraordinarily vast secret world in which very big important decisions are being made on our behalf that, that not only don't we know about them, but when we suspect that they're there and ask questions, uh, we get uh, we get highly misleading answers and lies. occasionally actual lies. Uh, I have a pretty high standard before I call something a lie, uh, you know, saying black equals white, things like that. But they're, 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 we've documented now a number of those in the surveillance area. I won't rehash uh, all of them. But I want to talk about, the, about, about some of the other things, uh, the very importantly misleading things. So Section 215 of the Patriot Act was not actually an obscure thing at all. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was among the most hotly debated provisions of the act. Now, people were imagining it would be used to uh, find out people's uh, library borrowing. So it was, it was, it was uh, often debated as the library provision. Uh, and the government said, uh, no, we're only going to take something when it's relevant 
to an authorized investigation, and we have to jump through all these hoops before it's authorized. And by the way, and, and they wouldn't, uh, for a long time, for several years, they would not release any information of, even about how often they used it. That was classified uh, on a standard that said it would do grave harm to national security to say the number of times they used this provision, uh, which was preposterous on its face. Eventually, Congress required them to issue the numbers, and they said, don't worry, Section 215, we only used it 29 times in uh, 2009. Uh, so it's obviously being used with great discrimination and precision. Uh, and now we find out, because of Edward Snowden and no other way, uh, that it took 12 of those times to get one trillion records involving almost every phone call all of you have made and every other American. So it took four per year to get every phone call <laughs> of every American. Uh, and they're putting out the idea that they only used it 29 times. Now, I don't know about you, but if anyone in my personal or business life were to tell me 29 when they meant a trillion, um, I would regard that as pretty highly misleading. And that is, frankly, <laughs> typical of the kinds of answers that they were giving public about the use of these surveillance powers. And so we did not have transparency. We were not allowed to make decisions for ourselves about where we wanted to draw the line. Uh, and that's a very big problem in a representative government. I'd like to yeah, make well, two points about this. Let me let Karen oh, sorry, real quickly sorry, jump in sorry. here, because I think uh, she wanted to. I just want to talk about this court thing, because you had, one, I mean, one of, one of the things is, just for the record, and I, you may or may not know it, but one of the things Snowden did um, was to make it possible for the ACLU to have standing in cases that it was bringing about the NSA. Because, so what happened is the NSA would, the, the, the ACLU would bring these cases like Clapper amnesty versus Amnesty International, and they would be told time and time again in the courts that they did not have standing. They didn't have standing because they couldn't prove that there had anybody was listening to them, right? So when Snowden released these materials, and particularly one piece of material, um, then it became possible for the ACLU to say they had standing. Now, the government has found a way to push back on that at this point, but it's still, it, it was still a way of getting to the courts, and I think that that's just a really important point. Right, actually, uh, just to add, just quickly to that. So courts are supposed to decide things on the merits whenever the, whenever the case is right. Uh, there, were, there were no decisions on the merits on any of the surveillance questions that were allowed to be brought about. You couldn't have a decision on the merits because there would be a procedural bar either Either the court would say we don't have jurisdiction, or we don't, um, or you don't have standing to bring the case. Uh, transparency enabled those hurdles to be leaped, and so there are now actually multiple cases going forward in which courts will decide for the first time: is it in fact constitutional well, that's uh, to do some of these things? Not right? only so, on that's, the okay, but it's the same with marketplaces. There were a small minority of mm -hmm. people who were who were uh, uh, ridiculed as a tin hat wearing. Uh, privacy nuts who wanted to shop for privacy in terms of online services. You, I, I, and I was one of those. I was, I'm a proud uh, tin hat wearer. Uh, <laughs> and I, you could not find out which of the big internet providers were going to protect your information and which weren't uh, because the terms of service are written by lawyers to mean we can do whatever we want. In fact, if you write a terms of service that doesn't say that, they get another lawyer. Uh, and even when you read them carefully, as I'm one of those odd people who do, uh, you can't find out what they're actually doing, and they don't have to tell you. Now, because of Snowden, because of the risks to their commercial businesses, uh, you are having a, you know, sort of a leapfrogging competition among all the internet companies, uh, the big companies, to show uh, that they are going to protect your privacy more than the next guy, and you have the emergence of a new market of uh, more boutique kinds of products in which you can, which you can shop for, uh, for more privacy. You have Congress, which supposedly authorized all this, and it's a big part of the, of, the, uh, of the justification by the US government. Well, Congress said, said we should do all this. When Congress finds out what's actually happening and when it finds out what the people think of what's actually happening, there's a whole flurry of hearings and bills to change it. Uh, so, uh, you know, you could go on in, in other dimensions of civil and governmental society. Uh, in all of them, the information was fundamental to enabling the process to work. 
Me, maybe you were going to jump in here. I want to, I wanted to take make, questions in a yeah, few minutes. I wanted to make two other points about secrecy briefly. Um, one is that there tends to be this assumption that there is a trade-off between uh, secrecy and security, and even security experts profoundly disagree with that, including the bipartisan post-9-11 commission. One of their conclusions was that we had too much secrecy. If there had been more information sharing, they actually said at two points in their report that, for example, if KSM had known that Musawi uh, had been captured, that he would have called off the 9-11 attacks. I was shocked that they, they actually made that, that conclusion. And no less a, um, a secrecy expert than the former uh, head of the whole classification system actually said that government decisions are demonstrably less effective in protecting national security because of the extreme overclassification that results in, in those numbers that you recited, Bart. How can it possibly be meaningful secrecy? Uh, Justice Stewart said it best in the Pentagon Papers case. He said when everything is classified, then nothing is classified. Uh, the second point I'd like to make about secrecy is I think we all agree that there are certain facts that should remain secret. The names of covert agents have been mentioned, battle plans. Uh, but the idea of secret law, when I first heard that phrase a few years ago, I thought, how can this possibly exist? And yet that, one of the things that we've had to use FOIA for with myth success so far are to get the legal decisions of the FISA court, which for all practical purposes is functioning the way the US Supreme Court should be in interpreting the Fourth Amendment and making these broad, as Jeff described, broad interpretations of what our constitutional rights are. You know, it's one thing to say, well, you could redact the portions of those opinions that may relate to programs and facts, but to say that we are gonna be governed by court opinions, the law of the land that we can't see is unacceptable. The other major source of secret law, which still, you know, we're fighting for, we've got some, we have not gotten a lot of others, are the memoranda of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, right, that uh, purport to, among other things, uh, misinterpret the Patriot Act and the Geneva Conventions and other quaint little uh, pieces of law uh, as supposedly authorizing torture. And um, since the government is operating under those, you know, treating those as the binding norms, that they are enforcing against us, I just, it's unconscionable to me that we ha still have not won the right to know all these important laws that are in fact governing us. Let me ask David, can I ask you a question? I, I, we don't have Michael Hayden here to provide another point of view. So let me just ask a, a, a Michael provocative, Hayden. no, but I'm gonna ask a we provocative question. We kill people question. based on that. Uh, we do kill people. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a provocative question. Here we had, all right, the assumption I think on the part of a lot of critics of government surveillance that it's, uh, you know, this is George W. Bush, this is Dick Cheney, they're, you know, maybe the Michael Hayden or whatever. Um, and if you get in a Barack Obama in there, that'll change it. He's a constitutional law teacher. He has promised us he's going to, uh, restrain the surveillance state and so forth. But he gets in there, obviously, and he doesn't, right? Not in meaning, as meaningful as probably the people in this room would like him to do. Is it possible then, should we entertain the idea that that's because, in fact, he shares the values of the people in this room, but as president feels, uh, you know, has come in the service of his office to have a different judgment about their value in, the, in, in terms of what he thinks as commander in chief, his duties are to protect the country. I mean, is there any valid validity to that way of thinking? Well, you know, I, I think it's um, it's it, it's complicated. I, you know, one one thing is is clear from from President Obama. Here's somebody who goes into office who I do think shares basically the values of most of the people in this room, uh, and he comes into office and he announces on day one that he is changing the way we're going. He's closing the black sites. He's ending torture. He's disclosing the torture memos. He's going to uh, uh, clear out Guantanamo in a year, right? Those, and those are all the public things that Bush had been doing that he objected to, and he immediately said, I'm going to change them. He hasn't been so successful on Guantanamo, but he immediately said he's going to change them. The, the, on, on warrantless surveillance, or not warrantless surveillance, it was warranted, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, dragnet surveillance, let's yeah. call it dragnet surveillance, we didn't know, the public didn't know. 
Presumably Barack Obama knew, although maybe he didn't know on day one. But at some point he learned that you know, the NSA was collecting everybody's uh, phone data, and he let it go. He let it go. He did decide, it, it, he decided it was reasonable. Well, I, I guess judgment, so, right? until yeah. it became public. public. Right. And then when it became public, then he appoints Jeff and the others to do the, right. the review panel. And then, and only then, does he announce um, reforms. And he has announced reforms. And, you know, the, the executive branch has, in negotiations with, uh, with Senator Leahy and uh, the, in Congress has agreed to more reforms uh, through the USA Freedom Act. So I think that just underscores the, this, this importance of transparency. So even when you have somebody who cares about our values, he's going to be better on those issues which are known to the public than he is going to be on those which are not known to the public um, because, of the, uh, be, be, because mm -hmm. you can do things in secret that you can't uh, uh, do um, uh, uh, that you can't do in, in, in the public right. eye. And um, the other point I would make about you know, his, his inability to change things or unwillingness to change things, um, you know, you, you're, you're just one person. You're the president. You come in, you've been a senator for, what, six months or whatever he was a senator. Before that, you were a you know, junior law professor at the University of Chicago. You're not all that prepared to deal with leading the, 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 the world. Uh, and you have to rely on the people who have been in the trenches, doing the work all along. And you know, I've talked to a number of people who were from our community who went into the Obama administration, and they would describe at any meeting at which there was an issue of civil liberties versus national security, there might be one, maybe two people who had been, who had been brought into the administration from the civil society community with that s set of perspectives. But there would be 25 people from DOD, DIA, CIA, NSA, FBI, you know, all the, all, and I'm sure I forgot six other agencies uh, who would be at the table as well. And you, and you just get, you know, you, you, you get overwhelmed. And the president has to rely on those people. He can't necessarily stand up against all of them. It's, it's, it's not easy. So I, so I think, you know, I, I've been disappointed. Um, in, in, in what Obama has been able to achieve uh, and what he's been willing to do, but I do think that we sometimes underestimate how hard it is to do that given the strength uh, and the momentum of the national security establishment. And again, that only underscores how important it is to have civil society as a counter, uh, as a counter. Let me ask one last question. We'll open up for, for questions in the audience. You can uh, ask our four terrific panelists anything you'd like. Karen. Do you expect optimism when this debate was coming up about what Congress would do in response to President Obama making changes? And you were quoted, in fact, saying this is a president who, despite his critics and despite wanting to keep something secret, has always wanted to be seen as a president who embraces transparency. So I guess I'm wondering, are you satisfied at this point with what has happened, what he has proposed, what Congress has uh, advanced mm -hmm. uh, as a response to this, or is that inadequate? It's not, it's not quite adequate. Um, but we're not talking about Guantanamo, you know. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about surveillance. Yeah, here. no, yeah. I, I th it's not quite adequate, and and the reason is that he hasn't sh he hasn't. Y y you ask him the question: Is Snowden been good or bad for the country? Right? The answer is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. And until the, the president can make that statement, that it, we need to, I know. I'm d okay. I can, he said I was the uh, he said <laughs> I was the ultimate optimist. That's what I'm being. So. He said he wanted a debate. He just didn't want Snowden to be the one to start I, it. Look, I want to say something about what, what Jeff Stone wrote in his report. In that report, there's a sentence, I'm paraphrasing, which says, you know, we have this debate. We're, ba we're balancing liberty and security. No, we're not. Did I get that right? No, we're not. We're not balancing liberty and security. We're talking about protecting our liberty. That, to me, would be what the president would need to say to actually push this issue of surveillance along. And one of the things, you know, if you, if you think you need to rely on these things that aren't giving us any information anyway, like your smoke alarm, then what else can you just conjure up that you need to, to do that with? I th and the ultimate reason for this, let me just finish here, is that the ultimate problem with all of this is not civil liberties, which is a big problem. The, the ultimate problem with it is that the American pop population is scared. They believe that people are trying to hurt them all the time, now their government as well, and that they need these measures to protect them, whether it's something as small as a smoke alarm or something as big as troops on their streets. And so 
when you asked me, my, you know, I, I would have liked to see a direction that was a little more confident about what that report says. Is no, this is no, we're not balancing this. So, let's yeah. uh, let's open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Let's open up for questions. Uh, uh, we've got two microphones here. Please come on down and maybe uh, we could ask people to introduce themselves. If uh, unless you're a confidential source, in which case you can <laughs> encrypt uh, Bart well later. Uh, but feel free to ask any of the four question, uh, uh, sir. Yes, this is open for anyone who wants to answer. Going forward, if we want a situation where, uh, what if, if we do get to the proper balance of. of, of Collecting information, whatever the rights of civil rights of uh, civil rights of uh, the public. What happens when someone is arrested? They got the wrong guy. Is there any way we could put something in place for someone to say, "Well, let's stop. The guy you've got is wrong. Undo this. Get on the news. Just like you've had that big hurrah, you got the right guy. You don't have the right guy, and turn the whole thing around. How do we put that in place?" Well, they're starting. I mean, I, you can, do you have something you want to say on this? No. But, so one of the things that happened as a result of, this, of the uh, Snowden revelations was the idea that a number of people had been convicted for terrorism-related crimes in the United States. Um, and apparently, they had not been notified that FISA intercepts had been used on them. And when the ACLU pointed this out, after and other people that were... Uh, um, th then then what happened was Attorney General Eric Holder said that he would start revealing, and I assume there's more to come, the names of those individuals whose cases did have these FISA intercepts that, and they had not, and their defense teams had not been notified. So those cases are under review. So I'm not, that's not solving the whole problem, but I'm just letting you know that there's, there's now a sense that, you know, how you're convicted and the information, the evidence on what you're convicted has to be reviewed from, at least from the past however many years. You know, I, I think we, have, we do have processes that uh, allow us to make the claim that this is that you've got the wrong guy. And if you can make that showing, uh, you, 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 you're off. Well, let me show you something. Somebody's at home. <laughs> one of the authorities, one of the authoritative groups come and arrest you. You're on the news. All of a sudden, we've got 52 boxes of information uh, that this guy's guilty. They they're taking pots off the shelf. They're taking books off out your library. And these are the 52 boxes that they claim as evidence. And, and, and then, then when you guys go to court, you throw most of that out. And, and you know, you've got, you've got these agencies where pe there's a budget, there's people getting hired, people getting promoted. And then you go to court, and they're innocent. The neighbors don't know you're innocent. We're not sure. We, 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 you know, the person's lost their job. There's no mechanism in place to turn the whole thing around. Well, it is certainly hard to, ch to uh, rehabilitate somebody's reputation who has been wrongfully indicted and gone through the process. But we, do, we, uh, we have, a, uh, I think, a fairly robust process of, of the uh, very high standard of proof for criminal cases, habeas corpus in situations where people are detained administratively. Um, so there are ways, uh, there are procedures, and I don't, I don't think you can do much better than that uh, in terms of being able to um, ensure that people who are innocent are not wrongfully convicted. Let's go over here, sure. Thank you. Right, so I just want to follow up on what uh, Ms. Greenberg said earlier about how um, where so the, our, the reasons that we have lobbyists in place, that the protections in, or protections in place, the security, the more of security state, the, all the surveillance is because we're a scared society, and we see this not just in surveillance. We see this in like the uh, school students that are like suspended, for example, for like making guns out of pop or making pop tart guns, for example, or firing like rubber uh, rubber bands at people like in the gun shape or whatever. We see this in the uh, what was it? what else was I thinking? In the in the ra the police raids or, or where the time police police will even like for a nonviolent defense will like go and send like giant military equipment great equipment um they'll, that they got from the Pentagon um they might even do, like they've uh, recently tried to investigate like they investigate barbershops using this for no reason except to like check the license which is completely ridiculous what would have to change in the culture the American culture in order to, for um us to be less scared to be less uh, accepting of these kinds of uh, violations, where we're going to be less of a security state, we're going to be less scared, um, and we're going to be less tolerant that these actually exist in the widespread area. You know, f fear is, is such a, a major theme, you're absolutely right, and I know in the ACLU rhetoric, Anthony has, among others, has given uh, many eloquent speeches about, and, and, and some of the most pro 
civil liberties opinions on the United States Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis springs to mind, have said, you know, fear motivate men feared witches and burned women, right? Um, and he, uh, that conversely, the founders of our country were not motivated by fear, they had courage. Now, it's, it's easy to say it, but how do you persuade people to really feel that way? Because you're talking about an emotion, not logic. You can start uh, with a point that uh, Jeff, among others, have, have made, which is that uh, you look past at past history, and we have, and Susan made this point, we have always exaggerated what the fear was or what the danger was, no exception. We have always exaggerated how effective the suppression of civil liberties measures would be. But I have to tell you, um, Lauren, Lauren, is Lauren. that you? Lauren? Um, that what I encountered throughout all of my civil liberties advocacy, and it did include school shootings and other episodes that, that precipitated backlashes in terms of cracking down on rights, or the internet. People were so scared of the internet long before your time, but that was like so dangerous, <laughs> you know, new and different. And you would say, but wait a minute, we had that same overreaction to TV, we had that same overreaction to radio, you know, we've had that same overreaction to the printing press, and people say, no, but this time it's true. This is new, this is different, this is unprecedented. When I talk to my students, I say it's like a historical hubris. We believe that you know, never before in history have we encountered anything comparable. To me, one of the most disheartening episodes immediately after the 9-11 attacks was, I mean, literally, like within days, the TV networks had rounded up survivors of the Japanese internment camps who said, this is different, we should round up and in turn, um, immigrant, young immigrant Muslim men from South Asia and the Middle East, because they really are dangerous. So I, I, I think it takes a social psychologist or anthropologist to answer your question. I, I just want to say one thing very quickly. One of the problems, and I'll, don't ask me the solution, but one of the problems is that there's some relationship between saying that we need mass surveillance, so we need every fact on Earth in order to figure out who wants to hurt us. What you really want is an intelligence agency that says, you know what, we get this, we understand this, we don't need to look at a billion things because we know what to look for. And I, that wouldn't solve all the problems, but I do think there's something about needing every possible, what is that needle in a hate, the whole, the whole haystack, what was that, Hayden Clement about the, we need the whole hate, what, I think that has something to do with it, and I think so. I think it's related to this surveillance issue in in that way. And I'll just I, I would just quickly add that I, I'm a little more optimistic, um, at least on the issues of surveillance. You have now what uh, 16 months of ongoing intensive international and national debate. Uh, you have, for the first time that I know of since 9/11 a majority or plurality of Americans fairly consistently, it, it ebbs and flows, have said uh, that Snowden did more good than harm. Uh, a large number also say that he ought to go to jail. Uh, that's the way we are, even one person, you know, we can, we have, we're of two, two minds about things. But, but they, think, they think the disclosures uh, uh, have done some good and they're worried about some of the, uh, of the things the government is doing and we hadn't had a lot of that uh, even throughout the big civil liberties debates of the Bush administration and early Obama administration. Uh, and so I think there are times when people are ready to hear it. And what's going to have to change, and this relates also to your answer, David, I think on President Obama, is there's a political culture right now of absolutely zero tolerance for any bad thing that happens uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to security. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so you know, a thwarted plot to kill seven people in a mall or, you know, uh, is, is considered a national security emergency. But you're also seeing, you're, you're seeing a backlash against that. So when, when, when a, when a well-known reporter on CNN is standing in Ferguson uh, and pointing the camera and saying, no, come here, I want to show you something. And first he points to the protesters. He says, there is absolutely nothing happening here that justifies this, and the camera pans over to this giant militarized uh, uh, police response. When you start seeing that kind of thing happen, um, I, I think people are ready to, to notice uh, when things have gone too far. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh. 
I was just going to say, I was going to uh, agree with that. I think that we, we do, we, what it takes often is some uh, demonstrated overreach, right? So the church committee uh, hearings were tremendously powerful in, um, in educating the American public about the dangers of national security surveillance um, for domestic political freedom. And that, um, you know, that, that's a lesson that's part of our culture. And I think we're relearning that lesson now in the digital age. And the digital age was very different. I mean, it, it used to be that we could rely on the um, incredible cost of the government having, you know, following us around and monitoring us to be fairly confident that they wouldn't do it because it was just too expensive. They didn't have the resources to do it. But computers have radically reduced the cost of mass surveillance. And so now we are in a world in which mass surveillance is a reality. We can no longer rely on those kind of pragmatic obstacles. And what Snowden has done is to put the world on notice that this is not just some abstract discussion that criminal procedure professors uh, you know, have been talking about for uh, a decade or so. This is real. It's going on right now, and we need to address it. So raising the, the I, don't, I don't know how you deal with fear on this side, but one of the things you do is you point to the real reasons to be afraid on the other side. And that's, again, part of what the ACLU does, is to demonstrate the concerns and fears uh, from the other side. Yeah. I think, though, this is OK. I think what, uh, what Snowden has done for democracy has certainly been a great help for our country. But I think one reason that he's considered a villain by some people, which is why you were booed, and then other people may cheer, is that it's not as clear, it seems to me, as the Pentagon Papers, which were one particular thing that were taken for a particular uh, reason, whereas this is a large group, a large bit of, of information uh, that's just taken really uh, a mass sweep and given to a, a few reporters to decide whether this is appropriate to tell the, the country and the world or not. And that seems to me, that part of it, I think, was irresponsible. So it's, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to really decide where, where you stand on Snowden. I mean, I think one contribution really was great, but I don't think that he's, well, he's sort of neither villain nor hero, as far as I can see. And if somebody has an, another way of looking at it, I'd be happy to hear. Does anybody want to respond specifically? I'd or? like to say something about the Pentagon Papers, because uh, we all know that the Supreme Court allowed them to be published. Many people don't know. Well, every single Supreme Court justice on the court wrote a separate opinion, and six of them said the publication of these papers will lead to great national harm, uh, that there's at least a great danger that that will happen in terms of um, increasing loss of life on, on all sides, including undermining diplomatic efforts, and yet they still concluded that they should be published. So again, it's not necessarily an opposition between, strict opposition between risk to national security uh, and, and, and transparency. I think it's very likely at the time that there were as many people who thought Ellsberg was a villain as thought he was a hero and thought he had over uh, disclosed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, you know, and, and I think I, my guess is that, it, you know, from a historical standpoint, Snowden will be viewed much more as a hero than as a villain. At the moment, it's, you know, it depends on what country you're in. Well, it, it is interesting, too. I think you make a good point, which is the Pentagon Papers also was, at that point, a review of past actions mm -hmm. as opposed to about current actions by the government, which should or should not be part of our public debate, right? And I think that uh, the Pentagon Papers, I think, is a little harder, in fact, to uh, justify uh, keeping secret since it was a review of things that happened in the past. And th there's, this, this debate is more, uh, a little more complicated because, in fact, as Bart says, some things, if you disclose it, that's the end of it. And therefore, you have, in fact, come down to a uh, judgment on without actually subjecting it to public debate. But just by virtue of disclosure, you've, you've created a, a change in that. Anyway. Uh, Anthony. Yeah, so I just had uh, two quick comments. And first, to thank the you, organizers man. of the conference, I want to thank them very much for pulling us together with such a diverse group of participants. And, and <laughs> I think it's been very helpful to hear it from the historical perspective. And it's uh, the first conference I've gone to where I hear history 
about some of the work I've done and I feel very adequately old as a result of it. So I appreciate <laughs> the reminder that now I'm, I'm, it's time for me to age and move on. But uh, on the surveillance issue, the Karen, Karen's point on the surveillance issue, you know, I think it's, it's interesting to watch how this issue has ebbed and flowed over the last 13 or so years. And so it, you, you can't really look at the context of Snowden without recalling, and I know that your next book is likely to do this, but to go back to the beginning and talk about the Terrorism Information Awareness Program, you know, Total Information Awareness Program, TIA, where leaked earlier, I think in 2003, they were gonna apprehend any and all documents to know the terrorists among us, and including uh, using postal workers uh, at that time to be informants of the American people. And there was a great outcry, and it was renamed from Total Information Awareness to Terrorism Information Awareness, to ter Terrorism Information Program. And then it kind of subsided the concern, but then New York Times coverage showed that in fact, much of the program of TIA continued. Uh, the, the Section 215 litigation, I mean the library records litigation was, seemed sometimes a bit uh, far-fetched. The idea that these lovely little anonymous librarians were concerned about the, the identity of their patrons and needed to speak out and to be unmuzzled. But it was the only way we could lay a glove on Section 215. Because remember, there was, they were the only ones who were able to come to us and tell us that they were the subject of a 215 order. And so in some ways, it was trying to grapple with the tip of the iceberg uh, that, that surfaced above the water, even though you knew there was a much bigger iceberg under the waters. And it wasn't until the Snowden revelations that we truly saw the full extent of, of the Section 215 powers. And then Nadine will remember, the way that we really began to zero in, and we can talk, Karen, later if you want, on, on, this, on how surveillance popped on our issue. I remember early on, and Susan remember this too, we, when the Patriot Act was enacted, and there was no outcry from the American people. We did a series of focus groups to, f to walk the American people through, or sub-segments of the, of the American people, as to what provisions of the Patriot Act were most nefarious. And we had the immigration provisions about the kind of summary deportations, the, the expedited deportation provisions, the things that really popped in the focus groups were the sneak and peek orders and the 215 orders. And that was our first hunch as advocates to say this is, this is a nerve that if you can hit with the American people, well, you could use that to, as a way to galvanize public attention. And so it's one of those instances where latent public opinion could inform advocacy in a way that would then build uh, public opinion and build advocacy. And I, it would be interesting if I could dig those up somewhere in my office. They haven't yet gone to the archives. We'll get them to you at some point, Dan. But uh, <laughs> they're just sitting in some, in some boxes. I, I'd like to ask you all to comment on, and then the other comment on Snowden. The, there's a movie coming out with Laura Poitras. And those of you who asked the question about why Russia and whether or not you know, the, the decision for him to go to China and to Russia <coughs> speaks about his motives. Go watch the film, because I think that there's some footage in real time of him sitting in Hong Kong where you can't walk away but feel that that was not part of a grandmaster plan for him to end up in Putin's Russia. Uh, he'd have to be an incredible Academy Award winning actor to pull that off if it were preordained or pre-designed. I mean, it shows it in real time what, what I think Bart described as less than a fully thought through plan and how he ended up there. And I think it might get to some of the points of motive and, and the circumstances that led him there. I, I'd like the question I'd like you to all ask, including Peter, if you would, is on the prosecutions of whistleblowers and even journalists on their sources. And so talk a little bit about the Risen case um, where you increasingly you find even this administration, especially this administration, being very aggressive in targeting journalists, uh, whistleblowers, even human rights groups like ours for, uh, for investigation and for leaks of what they think are sensitive public uh, information. Uh, there are some in this room who know quite well that the ACLU in the first time in its more than 90 year history was subject to an open criminal investigation led by Patrick Fitzgerald because of our lawyers defending the high value detainees at Guantanamo. And what had never been done under the age of J. Edgar Hoover, or even with the Nixon in power, uh, came to pass in the Obama administration, where we had to fire, we had to hire, rather, defense lawyers to represent our defense lawyers. 
and it ultimately led to the prosecution of Kuriaku. But it was really quite startling when you think about that in the context of an administration that talks about transparency and openness and rule of law. And I'd be interested in your thoughts around the Risen case in particular, what it bodes for the level of transparency in, among journalists, what it might mean for, for lawyers who work not just at the ACLU, David, but elsewhere, and, and, and Karen, how you put that in a, into a broader historical context. Anyone want to, Bart, you want to start about, um, talk about, I mean, what do you, we, we talk about the Espionage Act and the, the commonly used phrase, we always write it, I've typed it a million times, is that there have been more Espionage Act investigations of the leaks uh, under this president than all the previous presidents combined. It's seven compared to, I think, eight. three, eight, eight yeah. compared to three. How uh, does that affect you as a journalist? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, you remember um, the epistemologist Don Rumsfeld uh, <laughs> with the, uh, talked about uh, and it became, you know, he talked about unknown unknowns, right? You know, so known unknowns and unknown unknowns. I don't know all of the ways in which it has affected uh, my journalism because uh, there are people who might have talked to me or might have, uh, might have to told me something um, who aren't now uh, because they know that there is a much more aggressive tendency to use, use the idea that, that if you tell something to a reporter who intends to publish it for uh, the general public, that counts as espionage against the United States with, uh, th with the idea that this is the same thing as giving the information to a hostile foreign power with the intent of damaging the United States. Uh, that equivalence is grotesque. Uh, and it also means yeah. that the full national security powers of surveillance and otherwise of the US government can be brought to bear against me and my sources. If you can't, I mean, if, if uh, has anybody threatened to do that to you? I mean, I don't mean congressmen and so forth. Have you had any contact from the United States? It's not that I'm, I, I'm frankly, I'm not worried about being prosecuted. Uh, I, I think I could be, I, I think that there is a more plausible legal uh, scenario in which uh, they attempt to compel me to disclose confidential information from my reporting um, as they have with Jim Risen. Uh, and Jim Risen went all the way up to the Supreme Court and lost, and so it is now in the discretion of the U.S. government uh, whether or not to put him in jail. Uh, if they were trying to compel him to give up his source uh, for a chapter of his book, uh, they know very well who the source was, and they have plenty of evidence against the source. They don't actually need Risen's testimony. Uh, they've been doing this as a sort of uh, demonstration case, and um, as a matter of principle, journalists aren't immune uh, from standard legal process. Look at it another way. Uh, for certain really important institutions that we're trying to promote in our society that we really value, uh, uh, for example, the institution of marriage, we're prepared to carve out exceptions and say we are not going to force a spouse to testify against another spouse ordinarily in most circumstances. Uh, likewise, you have uh, psychiatric privilege. It might be that I've just confessed my fear of teddy bears. Uh, to my shrink, uh, and so there's no great compelling public interest in protecting the teddy bear thing. Uh, but we know that as long as soon as you as soon as you set the precedent that you can pierce that veil, as soon as you say that what you say to your psychiatrist may not be in fact confidential, uh, then you lose a huge amount of potential value of mental health treatment. Uh, and likewise, we have a situation in which one of the one of the important, I'll just say one of the important institutions that allows us to hold our government in check is independent reporting. And so there should be a very, very, very high bar before you try to uh, punch through that confidentiality uh, higher than there has been up until now. And because they're considering me reporting or a source talking to me um, as the same as uh, trying to help a hostile foreign power to damage the United States, they're allowed to use all their counterintelligence powers. And so they can, they, 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 there is, they could easily persuade a FISA judge uh, to put a uh, 215 order or a national security letter, uh, which they don't need a judge for, uh, or, any, or some of these other surveillance instruments against me. Uh, it would be open and shut uh, according to their interpretation of the law as it stands now. And there's something, I think, my, my own point of view, and I think socially from that point of view, uh, problematic about that. There was, uh, 
in, in yesterday's uh, ACLU daily news summaries, which I read religiously, there was an article about, uh, from the USA Today, about, um, right, about, I think there was just a national convention of the American Society of Newspaper Editors and another journalistic group, and Risen had given the keynote address, and they quoted him and others with great experience, um, some you know, who had been in the field even decades longer, saying that this administration has been the most hostile to journalism, you know, treating the process of journalism as itself suspect. And Risen gave the keynote address, and it was very rousing because he said, this puts even more of a responsibility on all of us investigative journalists to really be even more forceful in bringing to light and disclosing government abuses of power. It was, so ultimately, it was very inspiring. Actually, since, since Mike Hayden is in here, let me just put in one other word. I, I would note that I am sitting here uh, unmanacled, uh, you know, talking to a public <laughs> audience, uh, having done this also many times before and for 16 months now. I've been publishing uh, information that is stamped with the highest uh, classification stamps U.S. government has. I'm not in jail. Uh, no one has come and raided my office and tried to take the material from me. Uh, on balance, uh, we still have very, very significant uh, protections for journalism in this country, and I would argue that they are not the black and white uh, uh, statutory law, they're not even the uh, interpretations of that, it's the political and legal culture that's protecting me right now. It would be very easy to prosecute me uh, uh, if, you re if, you re if you read the Espionage Act literally. Mm. Uh, and I don't expect that to happen because we have a culture which does, to a very considerable extent, value independent reporting and protection for expression. I, well, I, I agree with that, and I think the fact that there have been 11 cases in the history of the United States suggests that there already is a there already is a high bar, and I think I find it very um, unlikely that the reason that the Obama administration <coughs> brought eight, whereas all the rest had brought three, was because the Obama because President Obama is less respectful of the press than Richard Nixon or uh, or, 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 or or many of, of his predecessors. I think it's much more likely. Um, part of this whole digital age, that there, that it used to be extremely difficult to identify uh, who was a leaker. And because of the digital traces that we all leave with our communications nowadays, it's much easier to do so. Um, well, and so but that, I, I, think that, I think that probably that, explains more of the difference. But that does raise the question why they need the uh, reporters. Well, if they I have don't know, the I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know about why I do they know. need uh, Jim Risen's testimony. I don't know about that, but I mean, the, 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 the one, the one where there was one where the the the, the, the leak was uh, of the fact that we had a uh, insider yeah. in uh, Al, Al Qaeda right. in the Arabian Peninsula, you wrote about and that. somebody incredibly irresponsibly um, leaked that and reported that, and they and they spent what eight months and 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 talked to. Something like 600 people to try to determine who the leaker was. It was an AP story, and they weren't able to do it. That's the old-fashioned way. And then they, uh, they they subpoenaed the records, the phone records, and within within a month they had the guy. They prosecuted the guy. He pleaded guilty, and it turned out he was also a child porn uh, <laughs> uh, uh, person. So I, you know, so I I I I wouldn't know necessarily say uh, you know Obama is the greatest uh, threat to. Uh, right. We, we want to wrap up here, I think. Can we have one, can we have one last very quick question? Because he was standing there. All right. We're just uh, super, super fast. We're going to do lightning round. You and you, and then we'll have the answers. Okay, about that. Uh, one quick comment, one question. The one thing that, that I think um, should also be noted is, in addition to the um, overclassification, the secrecy is the selective disclosure of classified information when it suits um, the government. I mean, when it's been in their interest, um, they've been, you know, things that you might think were classified have been disclosed. Just to, it, just to put it in historical context, last question. I mean, we've, the focus here has really been, as, you know, as it, as it should be primarily on the state collecting information about the citizenry or uh, foreign nationals outside the United States. But what's, I think, different about now than, let's say, during the McCarthy era or at other times is the, um, the extent to which the private sector uh, is also engaged in the collection of information. I would suspect, notwithstanding the work I've done, the ACLU and others, um, that private companies actually know a lot more about me than 
uh, the government just by, you know, what little ads pop up when I'm reading the Times online or whatever it is, um, or, uh, or the Post. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, so I just wanted if you could comment on, uh, on, on this. I mean, the, the question of the private sectors gathering of information, it's, I know it's different than the state and that they don't have the same powers, but. Uh, it's, right. yeah. We'll get this question here and then we'll come to let everybody finish up. Uh, I think it was either last fall or last spring, I was here for a, a panel presentation on whistleblowers. And one of the panelists discussed the difference between a whistleblower and just someone who leaks data. Uh, I found it really interesting because the, the difference was about discernment and the whistleblower basically describes a specific behavior done by specific people that does specific harm, whereas the data leaker, it's sort of willy-nilly without that kind of discernment and I just wondered if any of you would like to discuss that uh, distinction. That's a great distinction. We're going to take uh, these two quick questions and <coughs> go ahead and wrap up. Does anybody want to take uh, private sector uh, on the you know of course we have no constitutional protection against surveillance by the private sector and we have a dearth as you know very well of, of statutes that would protect us but there's really actually not such a bright line distinction anymore as we see the government commanding private sector to turn over the information that it's, it's gotten about, about us so I think we have to be equally concerned about that. David, you had talked about the distinction. I think the, 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 the lady's distinction is one you were making between Bradley Manning and, and uh, Snowden, is that right? Yeah, I think that's, I think, you know, there isn't, there isn't a bright line, um, but absolutely, if you're disclosing classified information, you are violating an oath not to disclose it, you're violating a law, you have to do it in the most, to be justified, you have to do it in the most narrowly tailored way uh, to disclose the wrongdoing uh, without doing uh, unnecessary harm, and, and that's a, a very hard judgment to make, and I think that's the judgment that, you know, that Bart's trying to make every day. <laughs> On that note, I think we're going to thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate <laughs> the questions for the great panel. David, Nadine, Karen.